There is no team in the world who can beat India at home right now. While the Indian fans are worried about trophies and all that sort of stuff, their team constructed one of the greatest home fortresses that we have ever seen in the history of our game. The house that Ash Jada built is legit. And yes, you can win a test for sure, but a series? It's hard to see that while India has this incredible varied bowling attack and their batting depth in their order just goes so long. Outside of like a catastrophic bunch of injuries, I can't see how any team is actually built to go to India and win a series. And when you start to see things like that, your mind starts to work a little bit. And so people are already wondering, can you make a team from a world 11 that could go to India of current players and win? And I've seen a lot of people have a crack at that. But we received a comment on this side that is even far more interesting than that. Because this is a unique Indian side. And the question that we saw is far more hardcore. So we have jumped in our DeLorean and, well, just got our whiteboard markers out, but to have a look at the history of cricket, to see if there is a team from another nation of time travelers that could come to India right now and beat them. You want to swing wildly at the internet like you've got the new pill in your hand, but you keep getting dead battered. Find the movement you want with NordVPN. They are our protection against terrifying cyber threats and wide battered geoblocks. NordVPN will help you get through any rights restrictions so you can watch all the cricket you want. We aren't always happy with the wickets we're on. Sometimes we need a change. NordVPN can switch your virtual location so your IP address is ready to cash in. So if you need to get around the internet's rules, or I suppose in our case, laws, select NordVPN. They can help you watch a game on a cheaper stream in another country. Give NordVPN the ball and let them penetrate all your vast internet issues. Because if you need a VPN, go Nord. Use nordvpn.com forward slash Kimba to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan plus four additional months for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. You can also receive a 20 gigabyte daily data voucher. The link is in the show notes. Protect your computer like a big hitter is coming for you at nordvpn.com forward slash K-I-M-B-E-R right now. Thanks to MV Play, I was able to make this. Their advanced technology can help any cricket team elevate their skills and performance. Okay, so if you look at the history of test cricket and dominating at home, the two teams that automatically come to you are Australia and the West Indies, right? Let's start with Australia first. Was there a team that could come to Australia and cause problems for them? Yeah, there was, because South Africa had heaps of fast bowlers available to them at that time, and they also had all-round depth, which Australia didn't have. Now, ultimately, Australia was still better, but it was a pretty fair contest, and South Africa did very well in Australia. Then you look at the West Indies, right? They were the previous team who dominated at home. Well, who was the team that actually came and took that off them? Again, it was Australia. Australia didn't have the same kind of pace bowling as the West Indies, but they had a lot of depth in their fast bowling in the 90s, and then they had something that the West Indies didn't have, which is a world-class spinner that could be used anywhere. And so eventually they ended the West Indies. And if you think about it, it was South Africa who actually beats Australia as well at home, right? But during India's run at home, there hasn't really been a team that's been set up to really challenge them. That doesn't mean that there haven't been teams throughout the history of cricket from some of these exact nations who could have challenged India. And the things that I'm looking for are quite specific, right? So we've got here fast spin. It's all well and good to bring spinners to India, but if you look at the history of the game, it's been the bowlers who can bowl a little bit quicker. In places like Sri Lanka, you don't always need to bowl fast spin, but specifically in India, because of the speed of the footwork of the batters and also the way that the pitches play, it does need to be that little bit quicker. So if you're not coming with fast spin, you're probably not going to do very well. You also need flat pitch quicks, right? You don't just need quick bowling. You don't need seamers or traditional things. You want people who can do maybe reverse swing, who can dry up an end or whatever that may be, but are a constant threat every time you want to bring them back and give them the ball. Another thing that you want is batting depth, because if you're going up against this Indian lineup that's gonna have five frontline bowlers, there's always gonna be a couple of mini collapses. If you can't bat down the order a little bit, I think you're gonna get rolled. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that Ashwin is the greatest bowler against left-handers we've ever seen. Some of that is the combination of DRS and Ashwin, but essentially, he is so good, you can't turn up to India with just a whole bunch of left-handers. And then finally, all-rounders is really important. And the reason this matters, it's the flexibility, right? Not every Indian wicket is exactly the same and you need to be able to change things up. So you need someone who has some kind of skill that can add to it. And again, remember, India are gonna have five bowlers. You need probably five bowlers as well, or you need the best four bowlers ever. 
So this is what I went looking for, really, in the history of our game, to see if there were teams like this. And you instantly go to some of those more famous Australia and West Indies sides, and, and they will both come up again. But the truth is that neither of those are brilliantly set up for this, right? But there are some peculiar teams throughout the history of cricket that maybe are not as famous that actually do have this kind of thing. But let's start with teams that have actually beaten India of modern times. I'm stretching modern back to the year 2000 here. But you've got the South African team. So they beat India in India, and I went and had a look at their bowling lineup to see who actually took the wicket. And it's fascinating because Hansi Cronier took six wickets in that series, and Nicky Boyer took seven wickets in that series. So really it was a collection of a bunch of different people. I really can't imagine going to India now with Hansi Cronier's bowling, let alone Nicky Boyer's bowling. So I'm gonna say that that team would definitely not win against them if they had to go back now. Then you've got the 2004 Australian team. Now, of course, this is kind of at the end of the Australian run and things are starting to crack a little bit and everything, but that team had Shane Warne. And I also think they specifically had a Shane Warne who understood he needed to bowl a little bit different in India by that point, and probably the best he bowled in India consistently over an entire series. The backup spinner though was Nathan Horrocks, and they also got a six for nine from Michael Clarke at one stage. The six for nine from Michael Clarke might still work, as we've seen with Joe Root recently, Nathan Horace is such a step down from Ashwin and Jadeja that even if you're boosting Shane Warne up, I still think there's an issue there. But you have to remember that this team also had Gillespie and McGrath in it, right? Like it was a legit great attack, all things considered, and also had a lot of batting talent. But it didn't have an all-rounder. It didn't really have any fast spin. Uh, flat pitch quicks is fine. Batting depth is fine. And there's a couple of left-handers there, let's be honest. I'm going to say that this team probably, again, doesn't beat them. It, it can win some test matches. I can't see how it wins the series. And then, of course, we have the most recent one, which was England went over here, which is a really, really good side. You look at the bowling attack here, you had sort of peak Monty Panesar, uh, Graham Son, who we didn't know was going to go on to be as good a bowler as he did, and you also had Jimmy Anderson, maybe just before he becomes great Jimmy Anderson, but he was still a pretty good player at that time. Uh, on the batting side of things, you have Alistair Cook, you have Joe Root, you have KP, you even had people like Matty Pryor further down the order, right? Like, it's a really, really stacked team. It's got a little bit of fast spin. I worry about the flat pitch quicks. The batting depth isn't that deep, but the actual quality of the batting is really good. There aren't that many left-handers. That was a team that didn't actually have a great all-rounder, unless you count Tim Bresden. And when he went over on that series, he didn't do all that spectacularly. I think all things considered, Tim Bresden, who had a brilliant start to his career, I think by this point in his career, he was already starting to struggle a little bit. I, I don't mind this side at all. And again, I think they can win tests. I just don't think they can win the series anymore. And I know it sounds weird because they kind of beat a similar side in some ways, but I think the Indian side is the one that has changed. In fact, if you look at these two teams here specifically, in 2004, the Indian batters just failed epically. Like, great batters just not making any runs. And if you look at 2012, it's kind of an Indian side that is starting to develop, right? And one thing that they certainly didn't have was someone like Jasper Bumrah at that point. Okay, so since we started with South Africa, I wanted to go back to them as well. I wondered if there was any team in, in history that South Africa would have that would go there and be successful. Now, the batting for South Africa is actually not too much of an issue. I think they're usually pretty good at that. And the all-round situation plus the seam bowling situation, again, is no issue. The real question, though, has to be spin, right? Like, when was the last time that South Africa had multiple spin options that were anywhere near the level of Ashwin and Jadeja? And the truth is that the only time that they had spin like that was 1905-06. And of course, that's a team I know a lot about and sort of builds the beginning of South African cricket culture. It had four leg spinners in that side, right? However, they weren't particularly quick leg spinners. The one advantage that they had that would be really interesting if they traveled to India these days would be the fact that they were all bowling the wrong end and it was essentially a mystery ball. So you would be sending in 1905-06 four mystery bowlers to India. Slow mystery bowlers, but Indians hadn't faced that delivery before. They were going to have to handle it in real time. The issue is that 1905-06 team wasn't exactly a great batting team, but it did have a lot of all-rounders uh, because all those leg spinners also could pat. But ultimately, I just don't think it was that strong a team. But it is the oldest team on our list here. And it might be the only team we have here that actually could take a genuine mystery and make at least a modern Indian team try and work out what the hell they were going to do. But ultimately, probably still not going to win. All right. 
so let's go straight from then uh, to Australia again. I think this is really, really interesting. Uh, instantly, when I thought about this, the team that I thought from Australia that would have been really good was 2000 to 2001. Now this team actually went to India at that stage and lost. But what they didn't do was really use Colin Miller as much as they should have. It was at the point where they thought they, were getting, they could move on from Colin Miller. It was a very pig-headish and silly situation for them to be in. Colin Miller plays one test in 2001 against India. Um, and he takes six wickets at Chennai there. He was an incredibly fast off spinner. The problem was at that point that Warren was struggling and was bowling very, very slow. But they do have a lot of batting in that side. They had Pete Gilchrist as well. Like there's a lot of really cool factors there. It's an interesting team, but not an automatic one. 69-70 is a really interesting one because that was the last time that Australia won in India before 2004. So this became an almost mythical team. So I wanted to go back and have a look at it. Ashley Mallet bowled very well in that series and they also had the mystery spinner, Jack Leeson. Essentially carom balls, but before they were carom balls. And they had some really good batting in that lineup as well, but it wasn't a great side. And obviously they got absolutely flogged by South Africa not long after that. I'm gonna say that that team probably wouldn't trouble the modern Indian team all that much. This is a team that doesn't really exist, but it was from available players at the time. So I'm looking around that 1950, 1951 point, and there's a real reason that I'm looking at that. In this period, for five test matches against England, Australia pick a guy called Jack Iverson, who is essentially a mystery spinner, and the person who really invents the carom ball, you know, years before anyone else does. Against England, he averages 15 with the ball. Now, that's all he ever plays. All we know is he plays a little bit of domestic cricket, no one hits him there either, and then he just sort of disappears from cricket altogether. But that period has a stacked batting lineup. Bradman has left, but there's plenty of other guys like Arthur Morris and Neil Harvey out there available. So the batting would still be fine. It also has Keith Miller, so it has a genuine one of the greatest all-rounders of all time in that side, and it has Miller's partner, Ray Linmore. So the seam bowling isn't a problem. It doesn't really have a great second spinner that was available to them. Although Richie Benno makes his debut in 1952. So I suppose he was available, but it actually takes a long time for Richie Benno to be good. But there is a guy called Bill Johnston, who you might remember from a Jasper Boomer video recently, who could actually bowl spin. So you've got a mystery spinner at one end and you've got a very strong left arm finger spinner at the other end. That's not a bad little pairing. Again, looking at the entire team, I just think it is missing one really high quality spinner. And if they had that, that would be an interesting one. And now we get down to, of course, 1932, 1936. This is Bradman. Bradman has the highest batting average against spin in the history of cricket. It's higher than Sonal Gavaskas, which is also incredible. I think they both average over 100 against spin from the data that we have available to us. And it's easy to say, well, yeah, he never played in Asia, but you've got to remember that there are lots of great spinners outside of Asia before World War II. <laughs> because the pitches in England and Australia and New Zealand and South Africa were much better for spin in those days than they were for pace. And it's also not just Bradman, there's McCabe and it's Ponsford and it's Woodfall. They've got a stacked batting lineup. We've got no worry about their batting. Their bowling is fascinating though, because in this period they had the guy with the world's most wickets, Clary Grimmett. The problem with Clary Grimmett is he was a brilliant spin bowler, but he was incredibly slow through the air. And I don't know how that translates. Now, he had things like a flipper and everything. So again, there was a mystery element to Clary Grimmett there. But I'm actually more interested in the other bowlers that Australia had. Partnering Clary Grimmett was a guy called Tiger Bill O'Reilly, who if you have a look, still has one of the greatest averages of any spinner ever. And he was, even for his time, known as a deadly quick wrist spinner. So think someone like Shahid Afridi in a time when Clary Grimmett was just popping them up in the air. No one could ever hit Clary Grimmett. And I think he's the perfect leg spinner for Indian conditions. As we saw with late career Richie Benno, those faster leg spinners do quite well in India. But there are two other spinners that are really fascinating here as well. A guy called Bert Ironmonger, who's a left arm finger spinner who has an incredible record. And also the famous Chuck Fleetwood Smith, who if you know anything about my career, I named an entire show on him. He was a drunk and a loose cannon and didn't actually care that much about cricket. But when you watch him bowl, Tiger Bill O'Reilly said that Chuck Fleetwood Smith had a more talent than he did. He was a left arm wrist spinner. And if you can see any footage of him, you'll see he was really quick for a left arm wrist spinner of that of that era. See, if you take Grimmett over there, you then have O'Reilly spinning the ball one way as a wrist spinner, Chuck Fleetwood Smith spinning the ball the other way as a wrist spinner, and you can make your decision between Grimmett and Ironmonger. That is a really good team. It doesn't have a lot of great pace bowling, and it also doesn't have an all-rounder. But it does have Don Bradman, who is kind of two great batters in one. 
And now we get to Pakistan. So we go straight to 1987 here. In fact, there might have actually been a brief moment where Pakistan had a slightly higher ranking than West Indies, if I'm remembering that correctly. But they were a fantastic team in the 80s. They have the all-rounder when it comes to Imran Khan. They also have Wasim Akram. So the pace bowling, certainly not an issue. Spin bowling is a little bit more of an issue. They did win a series here. They won a five-match series 1-0. Cricket was a little different back then. They have Abdul Qadir, and they also had Iqbal and Torsif. Abdul Qadir actually didn't do that well in India, and I'm not sure he'd be any more suited to India in modern times than he was back then. Iqbal and Torsif were both really good bowlers, but when it comes down to it, neither of them were anywhere near the Ashwin Jadeja level, so I just don't think that team quite goes up, especially as I'm not 100% set on the quality of their batting. Then we get to 99, and Pakistan actually played an Asian Test Championship uh, in India at that stage and won a one-off game. But this team has just an incredible amount of options that they can throw at it. They have both Mushtaqs, Mushtaq Ahmed and Saklain Mushtaq. They then have Shahid Afridi. So there's three top quality spinners available to them. When it comes to quick bowling, they have Wazim Akram, Wakar Yunus and Shoal Bakhtar all coming through. And then when you look at the all-rounders, they've got Afridi of course, but they've also got Azam Mahmood and Abdul Razak. So they've got like so many different options there. And if you're thinking, what about the batting? Well, they had Syed Anwar, who made 188 in that game, but they also had Inzaman al Haq and Muhammad Yusuf. That is a really, really interesting team, and certainly one of the ones that I rate the highest. And then you come to the Miss You period. This is the one that makes me the saddest, because if you look at what's happened to Asian cricket over the last couple of years, it's completely fallen off, right? There just aren't as many strong Asian teams as there was. You know, if you look at Asian cricket over the last few years, one of the reasons that India is probably so good at home is there isn't another Asian team that is anywhere near their level. Like Sri Lanka has completely fallen off. Bangladesh hasn't quite stood up yet. And Pakistan don't play India. Right at the moment, if Pakistan played India, they would lose 6-0 in a five-test series. But the Miss You team, I think, was a bit more interesting. Obviously, it had some really good batting, specifically great players of spin themselves. And I would love to have seen how Yunus Khan and Ms. Bal Haq would have gone actually playing this kind of a lineup. But their bowling's a bit interesting as well. I wonder if Yassir Shah and Pete Yassir Shah, before it completely all fell apart, would have been a fantastic bowler in those conditions. But Syed Ajmal definitely would have been. And they also had Rahman, the left arm orthodox bowler, who bowled pretty quick, right? I, I think he would have been a really good bowler in India. You can then chuck in whatever left arm pace bowlers they had at that time. I don't know. Let's put in Wahab and Amir. It's not a perfect side, but I think of all the teams that have gone over to India during this period, that's kind of the team we missed out on, right? That's the team that actually would have been the most interesting to go over. A combination of that, they probably still lose, but maybe they could have just played better cricket than most of the other sides did. Okay, now we go to the West Indies, and if you're a modern cricket fan, of course, you're just like, what are you talking about the West Indies? But we're not looking at anything modern. We're going way back with the West Indies. So 1983-84, the West Indies win there, and I had a look at that series, and it's fascinating, because there's three wickets to spin that I could see that the West Indies took. Larry Gomes took two, and Roger Harper took one. They basically won that series on the back of Michael Holding and Malcolm Marshall. And of course, they're two of the greatest seam bowlers of all time. So that would still be a handy team to take over. But with no spin, I just don't see how they go. Their batting was fine. I don't have any real questions with their batting. I just can't imagine you can go to India now without any spinner and be successful in the way that you could in previous eras. The pitches spin more, if nothing else. So I just don't believe that you'd be able to take this side over. There was another really successful West Indies team that went over in 1966-67. And I had a look at that and it was a really solid batting lineup and it had Sobers and it had Gibbs and it had Hall. But I don't think it was strong enough with its second and third spinners. So I've had to discount them as well. But there is a period of time at which no one actually went over with the West Indies team that would have been a perfect team for the subcontinent. So the team I'm talking about had Sobers. It also had Lance Gibbs, who was the off spinner who took 300 wickets. But at that stage, I had two other spinners available to them as well, Sonny Ramadan and Alf Valentine. That's a lot of high quality spin to be taking over with an all-rounder who can also bowl spin. So essentially they had off spin covered, they had left arm finger spin covered, and they had left arm wrist spin covered, and a left arm seam bowler, all in four bowlers. And if you want flat track bowlers, there's always Roy Gilchrist, who was the guy that went to India and started bowling beamers. Let's hope he doesn't do that anymore but he was genuinely fast. I'd have him as the backup bowler because you've also got Wes Hall, who I think would have been a fantastic bowler and a really handy player to have. When it comes to the batting, they had all three W's available to them in this period. They also had Conrad Hunt and Rowan Canai. Like they were stacked with batting. They had six incredible batting options, a great all-rounder, decent fast bowlers, and lots of high-class spin. That is a really interesting team to take to India now. 
So when looking at the rest of the teams, I think instantly when it comes to New Zealand, we probably just have to move on, right? Uh, Dan Vittori is the best spinner they've ever had. They've never really combined him with anyone else. And so while they played okay in India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka at times, I don't think there's any team I can make from the history of New Zealand that really would go to India right now and be successful. Sri Lanka is the more interesting one here because my original thought was you take Murali. And then I went, wait a minute, Murali never really was that successful in India. And then I thought, well, there was a period where they could have taken Murali and Harath, right? So maybe that's the period you take them over and you've got Mahela batting and you've got Kumar batting. Um, you've got Chaminda Vas with his seam. You've got a few different options available to you. But then I looked at Harath's record in India as well. And he wasn't any good. Plus the fact that Sri Lanka ne never actually picked Harath when Murali was playing all that often. So I don't know how you make that claim. So I think Sri Lanka would have been pretty good against India at home in that period. But I think if they had to travel to India, I'm not sure I could come up with a great team to beat them. Although on paper, without looking too deep, it's quite clear that they have a very good lineup to offer. And now we go to England. In 2012, they were the last ones to win. And there's two sides that I've come up with here that I think are very, very interesting. This is 1908 to 1914. And there's a couple of things that happen in this period that make this an interesting side. Firstly, they have Sid Barnes, who obviously never played in the subcontinent, but everything we know about him, I can't see how he wouldn't have been a success. And of course, with a bowling average of like 16 and a half, he's a pretty handy bowler to have. And at the same time, they had Jack Hobbs, who was averaging, what, about 10 or 15 more than anyone else in the world. So they had the best bowler and the best batter in that side, and they also had Wilfred Rhodes an all-rounder, and specifically, a spinner. So they had a lot of options to be able to go around, but when you looked at that team deeper, there were some good players like Gunn and Woolley and everything else, but it wasn't as solid a team as I thought it was, and so Barnes and Hobbs and Rhodes really carry that side when they're going to India. I'm gonna say that team definitely wasn't gonna challenge India all that much. But this was the team that I first came up with England. We're talking about 1952 to 1957. And this is the period at which England still have uncovered wickets. And so they're still pretty much dominated by spinners. They're also starting to get some seam bowlers coming through. So it is a combination of both. But the spinners here are absolutely wild. They have Jim Laker, who is a fast off spinner, who I think would be brilliantly suited to playing in India. He never actually played in India, but you know, he took 19 wickets in a test once. Behind him, you have two really good bowlers as well, Tony Locke and Fred Titmus. But perhaps the most interesting spinner that they had available to them over there is a guy called Johnny Wardle. Johnny Wardle bowled left arm finger spin in England. But when he went to Australia, he bowled left arm wrist spin. He could basically change his bowling for conditions in a way that most bowlers can't. Now, I would assume his left arm finger spin would be much more handy on the Indian wickets. Unless you're bowling to the tail, and then I think the left arm wrist spin could be really handy. Having both of those options would be good. And he's not the only left arm wrist spinner that you can put in this side, because Dennis Compton was one of their batters, and he didn't bowl that much in test cricket, but he had left arm wrist spin available to him that he used a lot in first class cricket. Now let's have a look at the seamers. They had Fred Truman, who was legitimately fast, terrified the Indian batters of that era, but it was also very, very skillful, and I think he would have found a way to be successful in those conditions. And the second seamer, if they needed it, would be Frank Typhoon Tyson, who was legitimately probably the quickest bowler in the world around that time. And weirdly enough, didn't play as much cricket for England as he should have. And you remember what I said at the start, you also need all-rounders. They had Trevor Bailey, who could have played as the second seamer and also been a more than useful batter in those kinds of conditions. And then finally, we come to the batting. I've already mentioned Compton. Didn't have a great record away from home, but I think he would have used his feet and at least tried to do something against the Indian spinners. But they had Lynn Hutton, Ken Barrington, Peter May, Colin Cowdery. Like that team was absolutely stacked for batting options. And they could have just picked the guys they thought were best for Indian conditions. Lynn Hutton, I mean, if you don't know anything about Lynn Hutton and Ken Barrington, just go over and check their batting averages. This is next level talent. This, I think, weirdly enough, an England side from the 1950s might actually be the team that I think has the best chance of being in India, in India right now. And that doesn't mean that they would do it because I don't think we can even invent a time machine. But I would have them as number one and I would have the West Indies in that 1960s period is probably the second most likely. I'll go with Bradman's team as number three, even if I'm not 100% sure that Grimmett works there. At number four, I will go to the Pakistan team of 1999. I really like the balance there and the fact that they don't even have to play Mushtaq Ahmed, who wasn't a particularly great bowler in Asia, weirdly enough. I think that makes that team even better. And then the fifth most likely team is probably the Australia of 2001, Australia of 2004, 
or South Africa of 1905 and 06. But honestly, I don't think any of those teams were actually gonna beat India and India. And that's because beating India and India right now is not particularly easy. There really aren't a lot of sides throughout the entire history of cricket who have been built to specifically play this kind of cricket. India are playing perfectly for their conditions with a never ending batting lineup with seam bowling and spin bowling, with five bowling options, with batters who can take a big bite out of you at any time. The batters haven't even made any runs and they are completely dominant. There's some very good sides on this board. They would all find it very tough to beat India at home right now. I have a book out with Abhishek Mukherjee and it is called Overthrowing Cricket's Empire. And it's about the stories of how each team beat England for the first time. We go all the way back to the demon Fred Spothoff getting annoyed at WG Grace for acting a little bit like Alex Carey. And then we come all the way to present times with Rashid Khan's England's Redemption. We cover every single team to beat England in a major international, but we also talk about the incredible stories like the barefoot basher from Fiji that almost played for New Zealand. In fact, this book is full of tales like that, like how Pakistan lost a top batter after he was on the run from an angry husband of a movie star he was having an affair with, and also how one future captain of his nation realized he might have to go out and bat at Lords and that he didn't own his own pads. Cricket was used as a tool by the empire, but what happens when those nations grow up and get good at it? Find Overthrowing Cricket's Empire on Amazon today.